So the question that I want to ask today okay, is um, whether these movements that we produce with our hands, whether they're anything more than hand waving, are they useful? Are they cognitively useful? Are they useful in learning? And what I want to suggest, two things. First, that the gestures that we produce reflect what we know. And secondly, that the gestures we produce not only reflect what we know, but can change what we know. So this is a woman who was asked to say how she gets from one place to another place and just watch how she talks. But not least, how about from home to Ashton? Okay, well, um, Ashton, um, we go left and then out to 3rd and then up to Jordan, then right again, and we go straight up to 10th Street, but we turn right on 10th. So Jordan is actually, which would be like right here, it's behind us instead of, instead of crossing into the library. Mm -hmm. So we go right. And then we um, cross a driveway, which is to, to right quad, and then cross a street called Sunrise. And then Ashton is going to, we keep going a little bit further, and Ashton, you turn right to get to Ashton. Okay, good. So there's absolutely nothing unusual about this woman's gestures. But there's something a little unusual about her, which you may have noticed. And that is that she's blind. She is congenitally blind. She has never, ever seen anybody gesture when they talk. Nonetheless, when she talks, out come her hands, and she starts to gesture. So what this suggests is that gesturing is a really robust and resilient part of talking that sort of comes for free when we try to communicate. So I want to give you an example, starting with the phenomenon that Piaget discovered and talked a lot about many years ago, and that is conservation. So in a conservation phenomenon, what Piaget does is he establishes two rows of checkers. They have the same number of checkers in it, and he makes sure that a child knows that and says, yes, there are two rows of two, the same row, number of checkers in the two rows. Then Piaget spreads one row out, and he says to the child, does it have the same row, number of checkers in the two rows? And most children, and you, I assume, would say, yes, of course, it's the same number of checkers. But some children, particularly those below the age of seven, say no. They think it's different. They're non-conservers. And so I'm going to show you a non-conserver who's going to explain her belief that these things are different. And she's going to talk about it, but she's also going to gesture about it. She says they're different because you spreaded them out. And as she says that, she does a spreading out gesture. Do these two rows of checkers have the same or a different number of checkers in them? Different. Which row has more checkers in it? This one. Why does it have more checkers in it? Because you spread them apart. Okay, so she is using her hands to say something, but she's actually saying pretty much the same thing that she expresses in her words. Now I want to contrast her with another child, also a non-conserver, believes they're different, says they're different, pretty much for the same reason. She says they're different because you moved them. But what she does with her hands is quite different. What she does is she does, she pairs up the chest checkers in the two rows. Now, if you notice, that's not how the checkers were moved at all. So the gesture that she's doing is qualitatively different from the words that she's saying. Do these two rows of checkers have the same or a different number of checkers in them? A different number. Which row has more checkers in it? This one. Why does it have more checkers in it? Because you move them. So this is a child who's produced different information with her hands. Now, if you listen to these kids, they actually sound like they understand conservation at the same level. But if you look at them, they don't. And as it turns out, if you instruct both of these children, it's the kids who produce mismatches, the kids whose gestures are different from their speech, who are ready to learn. They're much more likely to profit from the instruction than we give them than the kids who produce matches. What does this mean? Well, what it means is that these gestures that we produce spontaneously have cognitive significance. It's not about gesturing or not gesturing. Both of the kids are gesturing. It's about the gestures that they produce, the information that's conveyed in that gesture, and the fact that the gesture either matches or fails to match the speech. And that predicts who's ready to learn. So what this suggests is that gesture reflects what we know. It's a window. 
into our thoughts. Now, in order to know whether gesture can change what we know, we really have to manipulate gesture. gesture. We have to push it around. So what we did is we went to a math task of the following sort. 2 plus 4 plus 9 equals blank plus 9. Turns out that is a very hard math task for fourth graders in America. They tend to get it wrong. And when they get it wrong, what they do is they either add up all the numbers in the problem and they put that number in the blank, or they add up the numbers on the left side of the problem and they put that number in the blank. So what this child has done is she's put the numbers in the left side of the problem and she's um, put that in the blank. She's added up those. But what we did is to try to instruct her by saying, what you need to do when you solve this problem is to say over and over again, I want to make one side equal to the other side. And in addition, move your hands in the following way. And we make her tell her to put her... her um, a V point under the 2 and the 4, and then point at the blank. Because you notice, that's one way to solve the problem. There are two equal nines there. They cancel each other out. Group the 2 and the 4, and put that number in the blank. So she's taught to do this over and over again. And you can watch her. Okay, now can you say those words and do those hand movements for me? I want to make one side equal to the other side. Okay, now can you write your answer in the blank? Okay, so this is a group of kids who did this over and over and over again. And we want to see, and we compared those kids to kids who didn't make any movements at all, but did say, I want to make one side of the problem equal to the other side of the problem. And it turns out that if the kids are told to do their movements, they're much more likely to improve with instruction than kids who are told to not move their hands at all. just about moving versus not moving. We wanted to make sure that it's about the content of what they're doing. So we had one other group. So what we had to tell these kids to do is to put their fingers to point at the four and the nine and then point at the blank. Notice that that's the wrong numbers. So this is an incorrect gesture. We thought it would be terrible, really terrible. If all that gesture does is sort of point your attention at something, this is really a disaster. But the gesture does convey some useful information. It conveys the fact that two numbers need to be grouped, this two here, and it also conveys the fact that there are two sides to the problem, the V and the point at the blank. So it's partially correct. So watch this child. Well, first of all, can you say those words and do those hand movements exactly like we practiced? I want you to make one side equal to the other side. Okay, now can you write your answer in the blank? So kids like this, who are told to produce these partially correct answer, uh, gestures, actually did better than children who didn't gesture at all, but worse than children who gestured fully correctly. Once again, suggesting that it's the nature of the gestures that you produce, not just moving versus not moving, but the nature of the movements and the information that it conveys. And what we think is that initially these kids are producing these movements. They have no idea what they mean. But over time, over the series of problems, they get a sense of the meaning and they abstract a meaning. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the study, what the children are able to do is to talk about grouping and say, oh, well, the way you solve this problem is you cancel out these nines and you add the two and the four and you get six. So by moving their hands in a particular way, the children have learned how to solve this problem. This isn't great for education, for classrooms, in the sense that if a teacher has to figure out which gestures a child needs to use for every single problem, that doesn't scale up all that well. So what we next tried to do is just say to the kids, OK, next time you solve this problem, gesture. I want you to move your hands when you solve the problem, when you explain how you're solving the problem. Okay. So we did that. We had a group of kids who we told not to gesture, and a group of kids who we told to gesture. And we found that when the kids were told to gesture, they started to produce all these movements, like you saw there. They continued to produce incorrect answers. They continued to produce incorrect explanations in speech. But interestingly, the gestures that they spontaneously produced when told to move were correct. So they're saying incorrect things, and answering correctly, but their gestures are correct. So we've sort of created mismatches. 
So what we then did is give them all instruction, and we found that if the kids were told to gesture, and if they added in explanations that were correct to their repertoires, they were more likely to profit from the instruction. Once again, it's being told to gesture. In this case, just gesturing spontaneously. This can scale up, actually, because teachers can just say to their kids, OK, I want you to gesture when you're explaining this problem. And that may help the kid be ready. It may make the kid ripe for learning, for the education, for the instruction that he's about to receive. These are kids who already know language. What about language learning? Can gesture play that same kind of role in language learning? Well, we know that kids start to use gesture very early in development before they start using words. They point all of the time. And in fact, it turns out that if you find a kid, a young kid, who points at a teddy bear at one point in his life and he can't say the word bear, three months later, the kid is very likely to produce the word for bear. So the things that he points at early in development are just the objects that he's going to learn to name a few months later. So gesture is, again, predating and predicting what happens in development. More interestingly, I think, um, the relationship between gesture and speech can predict the onset of two-word utterances. So for example, a kid points at a ball and says ball. He's saying the same information with gesture and with speech. Another kid points at a ball and he says, he points at, uh, sorry, he says ball and he points where the ball should go in a toy. So in a sense, he's making a little sentence. He's saying ball goes there. Ball in his speech and the point conveys where the ball goes. That's a little sentence that's across his gesture speech uh, modalities. And it turns out that kids who produce those kinds of sentences, where he says ball and points where the ball should go, are more likely to begin producing two-word utterances, will produce two-word utterances sooner than a kid who just points at the ball and says ball. So once again, it's the relationship between gesture and speech that captures what the children are knowing at a certain period of time and making them really open to the instruction or to the language that they will hear. So it predicts how they're going to learn language or when they're going to learn language. We went into a kid's home um, for eight weeks. And once a week, we went into the kid's home. And we brought a little book, like that book there. And we had three ways of treating children. Either the children were just shown a book, and they, the book has a picture of a truck on it. And we said, here's a truck. See the truck? That's it, over and over again for different objects, for different pictures. Another group, we had a little book, said, oh, look, there's a truck, and we pointed at the truck. A third group, we said, oh, look, there's a truck. Can you point at the truck? Can you put your finger on the truck? And look at the truck. Can you do this? That's a truck. Yay! Good job. <gasps> Let's do another one. <gasps> Look at the pig. Can you do this? Yay, that's a pig. Yay. What happened was we went six weeks. And during that time, we let, let the parents interact with the kid for a half hour before we did this little instruction here. So not surprisingly, the kids produced more gestures when they were with us, when they were at the experiment. And we told them to do it. Of course they did. But those kids who were told to gesture with the experimenter also started producing more gestures spontaneously with their parents over the six-week period. Their number of gestures increased, increased, increased. And the most interesting result is that at the end of the day, after eight weeks, it turned out that they had a bigger vocabulary. They produced more words than the children in either of the other two groups, either the kids who saw no gesture at all or the kids who saw us gesture but didn't gesture themselves. But the bottom line, the point I want to really leave you with, is that gestures come in two types. One type are the spontaneous gestures that we all produce when we talk. Those gestures can help us learn how to talk. And once they've done that, they can help us learn other things. They reflect what we know, 
but they can also be used to change what we know, and consequently they can be used in an educational situation. The other gestures are gestures that I'd like to call home silent gestures, gestures that are produced without speech. Particularly in these deaf kids, it's striking because they don't have speech. And these gestures look really different. So the first kind of gestures are complement to language. The second kind of gestures really are language. They take on the structure of language. We know that, of course, that the manual modality can take on the structure of language because they're sign languages of the deaf. What's interesting about these children is that they're spontaneously creating it themselves.